Welcome to the Nation's Weekly Podcast. We are so excited to get to spend some time with you. To my left, Mr. Joseph Carlson, our editor and director, editorial director at Nation's Media. Uh, to you, it's actually editor-in-chief. Editor-in-chief, right, all, all, the, all the titles. And um, <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. Today we have a guest, uh, Mr. Todd Moorhead in the booth. Todd is a dear friend, and he is the producer and host of the film Hope in the Holy Land. That's going to be premiering on our platform here uh, starting today. So, um, Todd, welcome to yeah. our first in booth podcast here at Nations Media. Yeah, so good to be here with you guys. So, thanks. Yeah. Well, um, Joseph, um, well, let's start with you. Um, you got to watch this movie. Um, in fact, you just finished it about an hour ago. I so, um, what, what was your initial takeaway thus far? Um, <laughs> Honestly, I think the predominant reaction I had after finishing the film, Todd, was one of gratitude. Um, I mean, the whole film is, it's beautiful and it's complex, but particularly that second half, um, I i began to see and some of the hope that you, you and Jesse and the team discovered as you guys navigated. And I really appreciated just how balanced I felt like the film was, you know, um, when you would bring me into a place of tension because you're presenting, uh, you know, uh, or engaging with somebody who had a particularly strident viewpoint. And I, I felt questions starting to arise in me about like, well, Hey, I wonder what the other side, then sure enough, uh, you wouldn't leave me sitting in the tension too long before you yourself asked the question, or you engaged with somebody who represented just that kind of diametrically opposed perspective there. And so I just wanted to, to say thanks for uh, the, the amount of intentionality that was clearly demonstrated in the film with how you just engaged everyone with curiosity and charity and felt like you gave, you worked really hard to get out of the way of, um, of being the host and to let other people uh, just kind of give voice to their experience and perspective. Uh, and so I just wanted to say thanks for that. Oh, thank you. Thanks yeah. so much. That's yeah. really cool. <laughs> um, yeah, we had an amazing team. It was huge team effort. Jesse Schlentz was so much a part of that. Um, and Justin Crone, the other um, creator and producer. So yeah, thank you. But mm -hmm. that that's that hits the nail on the head for us. We wanted to be balanced mm. and it was hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, what, was, what was so hard about it? Um, everybody, there's nobody who has a, who comes into a top, well, okay. Anybody who knows a topic mm. has an opinion on a topic. So nobody comes in with a fresh slate. Right. And so to try to um, let people talk and hear them out and um, try to walk in their shoes, mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of a heart and it's, it's uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. I thought you lived in that tension really well. And I appreciated actually how from the get go, you were just really transparent with where you were coming from. Um, you know, you have been to the region, what, like over 30 times or something? Yeah. When was the first time that you went there? I was 18. 18. Yeah, I went with my dad on the typical church trip, you know, tour bus trip. Uh -huh. And I would say it changed the trajectory of my life. Mm. Uh, God had already put the Jewish people on my heart preteens early on. Hmm. I don't know exactly when it happened, but when, when I became a believer at four, some time after that, it seemed like loving the Jewish people and loving the land of Israel followed suit. Hmm. And I thought it was totally normal until I met my wife and she's like, this is kind of weird, but it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I, I went when I was 18 with my dad and it, it just really um, sparked a lot of curiosity of me studying, really, really diving into God's word. Hmm. That's where it really started. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned in the film towards the outset that, yeah, even though you'd visited it many times and you, uh, you've you led trips and whatnot, that the film itself was some of your first explorations into the West Bank. So with all of those trips that you were doing, what did that look like? Were you just, were you leading study trips? Were you going as a tourist? What was, you know? Yeah, for the most part, I was, um, for years I would take surfers over there and um, we would, uh, called it surfing the Holy Land where we would meet the local guys and, you know, I met one of my best friends there through those trips. And it was like that, that, that trip um, to kind of a novelty surf to come surf in the Holy Land. Yeah. Um, it is no surf destination, let me tell you. <laughs> but, um, but it was also a, like a biblical pilgrimage tour at the same time. Mm. And it was very relational with people. Um, and, and now these days I, I lead trips for Christians who, who wanna do a bi biblical pilgrimage and who wanna meet the people um, and the, and experience the land. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I can, and I, and I have the opportunity to show some of my films there as well. So, oh, so cool. um, it continues. 
So when you say topic and specifically topics that people care about, um, sure, there's lots of them and people care about lots. I care about baseball and people will argue about baseball. But you made a movie about the Holy Land where what people is that? are, is people that, are literally a or something? people are literally <laughs> dying. Um, right. You know, today in the news, ten Palestinians um, dead, and so um, I think Anthony Bourdain said it really well. He also went to the Holy Land, made a made an episode there. He says it's impossible to go there without being labeled a terrorist sympathizer, a Zionist tool, a self hating Jew, an apologist for American imperialism, an Orientalist, a socialist, a fascist a CIA agent and worse. And so I guess my question is, <laughs> did you feel any of those? Oh, you, there's one more. I was called a, um, uh, Israeli spy. Oh, wow. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Ooh. Yeah. That's a good one. I didn't know I had that intelligence, but I'll take it. <sighs> so, I mean, there's so much that people, so much thought and feelings that go into feeling, uh, you know, all the thoughts about the Holy land. So it's a charged topic. So, um, talk to me about just your personal journey in making hope in the Holy land. Yeah. So, um, it, it's a journey of discovery because what happened in my life is, um, like I said, I've always, I've had, had a heart for the Jewish people and for the land of Israel. Um, and I, if I was to be honest with you, I had a, a disdain for Palestinians because mm. I, I saw them as um, getting in the way of God's plan. Mm. Um, and, and, I, and I also saw some, I had historically heard scriptures taught about Ishmael, who most believe that the Arabs come from Ishmael. I mean, a lot of scholars believe that. So um, when they would read those accounts in Genesis, it was negative. And then I read a book called Arabs in the Shadow of Israel by um, Tony Malouf. Um, and it changed, it, it was like the beginning of changing everything. And I started to read um, in, in a totally different light of God's heart for Ishmael and how he took care of him mm. and um, how, how much God loved Ishmael. And so that started to transform my heart. And that was like the beginning of the journey. Mm. That's amazing. Um, halfway through the film, you say that you feel hopeless in, in your journey. Talk to me about that. I mean, wh <clears throat> what caused that? What, what, was it, what, what was it that you were seeing that made you feel like, man, there's just no hope for this place? Yeah, um, a, lot of the, a lot of what happened was just a man on the street interviews that we would do we, when we would go um, anywhere, whether it be the West Bank. So if you're in the West Bank and you're talking to Palestinians, it's called the West Bank. If you're talking to Jews, it's Judea, Samaria, right? Mm, There's a, yeah. um, so we'd be in the West Bank talking to Palestinians, we'd ask them a set of questions. And then if we were in Israel proper, we would ask Israelis the inverse set of questions. And, um, and when I was in the Palestinian territories, we would ask questions like, um, uh, do you believe that the Jews caused 9-11 to happen? Mm. Do you believe the Jews want to take over the world? Um, do you believe that um, the knifing attacks that have happened here in the recent, day, recent years were faked by the Israeli government? Do you believe Jews were descendants of apes and pigs? And almost categorically, they would say, they, they would agree, yes, 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 yes. Mm, um, wow. uh, those, those Palestinians that did believe that the Holocaust happened, like there was, there was plenty that said the Holocaust never happened. Um, and then those that did say it would say, yeah, but the numbers are, tr they're like, they, the numbers aren't real. They, they made them so much bigger mm -hmm. so that they could, the, the Jews could come here and take over our land and gain sympathy mm -hmm. from the world. And so the days like that, and then I had a particular interview with a, um, uh, a Palestinian Christian liberation theology guy. Um, and I just could not see eye to eye on, mm -hmm. not even one thing, not even one thing. What is that theology? Break that down uh, for That us. theology in a nut, I mean, if you look at the theology, they, they <laughs> I'll, I'll give you the nutshell of it. Um, rather than Jesus coming to save us from our sins and that we all sin, we're all sinners and we need saved, he came to liberate us all. And so you have the oppressed and the oppressor, um, a lot like uh, what's going on in our world today with critical race theory. It's very much mm -hmm. it, in the same theme. So I just couldn't see eye to eye on anything with him, whether it be uh, the situation or the scriptures he would quote and how he would quote them or the scriptures that I would quote and he would say, hmm, I don't take the Bible literally. Mm -hmm. And so 
uh, it, it just became, that was one of the most, the, the hardest interviews I, I did. And I think that okay. because the name Christian was in there and anyway, we were supposed to be brothers, but I just couldn't find any, like nothing in common with them. It's gotta be hard too. Cause I mean, we have theological differences here in the States and all that really means is you go to a different structure on Sunday morning yeah. and sing maybe songs out of a hymnal versus songs with an electric guitar. Right. But so there's varying degrees <clears throat> of it, but there's, there are those core issues that Christians have and we on the core issues wasn't even, wasn't even close. And there it's completely dividing. It's so you're dividing. literally on a different side of the fence yes. And, mm -hmm. uh, yes. or wall or yeah. whatever you want to call it. <laughs> um, it's a security barrier. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, you know, my, my journey in um, the Holy land, you know, I, I made one trip and um, I remember we, we stayed, we went through checkpoint 300. We stayed, um, uh, at near the Bethlehem Bible college there and, uh, got to, and I was doing an interview for one of our first journals, um, here with Sammy Awad. And while I was there, I was interviewing this incredible peacekeeper and getting to know his story, which you have Sammy in your film. And, uh, while I was there, I mean, all hell broke loose. Um, the narrative was that an Israeli soldier shot and killed a kid with a backpack um, I, I, under 10 years old. And so riots right in front, I couldn't even get back to where we were staying. Um, abs crazy riots. Um, and then an Israeli sniper shot and killed a Palestinian protester right in front of me. And um, I'm there and I'm, you know, I've got my portrait camera to shoot um, Sammy Awad's portraits and I'm there next to Ben Wiedemann from CNN and he's in his flak jacket, gas mask. And he's like, what are you doing here? And why are you using a Hasselblad camera? And, and, uh, so they gave, like CNN gave me a, a gas mask and I basically covered this uprising for two days and it was, um, it was wild. And I remember coming home from that with a, like, I was angry at Israel. I was angry at what I was seeing. I was also standing behind their soldiers because that was the safe, safest place to be. But you and I met up like right after that. And I was like, man, I know how like pro Israel you are. And I'm coming home like, man, I am not feeling that way right now. Right. And just um, trying to process that with you was so helpful. Um, I guess my question for you is in your journey, have you ever kind of flip flopped? Have you ever felt like, man, Israel's in the wrong or, or, Palestinians need some sympathy, you know, and I think, you know, the, the film kind of walks that journey with you, but um, talk us through how convincing people can be and experiences can be in your, um, yeah. how you so view So I think it's in. really important to, to realize that Israel is a, um, is a nation, it's a fallen nation, just like every other nation. And, and it's really interesting because when we talk about any other place, we give everybody so much grace. When we talk about Israel, double standards all over the place. Mm -hmm. Like they, they, you know, there's things done in the Arab world, like Syria killed 500,000 of their own people. Nobody said a thing, but when, when Jews kill, when Jews kill Palestinians, the whole world's up in arms, which mm -hmm. Jews killing Palestinians, it's wrong, right? So, um, I have, th there's things that I, I've said, yeah, that's, it doesn't seem right to me. Um, and, but being in the land and, 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 and walking around and asking questions, I realize that there, there's so much, um, there's so much, uh, the narrative runs the place. And so like, for example, the one question, do you believe that Isra the Israeli government faked the knife attacks? Mm -hmm. Like you could watch the footage I mean, it's in the hope in the Holy Land. It's all over the place of a Palestinian terrorist kill it, like stabbing an Israeli guard. The, the narrative is no, they didn't stab the, the narratives, the Israeli soldiers for fun. We had this guy, a guy tell me this in a man on the street interview for fun. They just want to mess around and they, they shoot the guy and then they plant a knife under him. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what they believe. So right. by the end of those days, you're like, what is going on? Um, that's not to say, that's not to minimize those areas that something really does happen and it is really wrong and something needs to happen. Um, but for sure, like I think empathy is, is the most important thing I learned. Mm -hmm. Empathy that, for both sides, right? They're, they're, both sides are going through a major struggle. Yeah, both sides are flawed. And mm -hmm. some, both, some, both sides are flawed. I love uh, what, um, Sammy says in the film, he says, uh, he found out that his enemy was not Israel. It was fear. And, um, 
talk to me a little bit about that, like how fear driven um, it is on both sides of the fence. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's that's interesting. I because he he was, I thought he was talking about um, the uh, like the Israeli fear that because of the Holocaust and all the stuff that had happened, they live in a constant fear. Um, that's I think that one of the things that Sam was saying. But on the other side, I could see that as well. I mean, there's a fear of the Mossad has struck fear in the hearts of of Palestinians, and they've done it on purpose because there it's a they're trying to win. They're trying to win a war, basically. Of they want people to think you're you're not ever safe to try to kill us. So don't try. And people are in complete fear because that you know. <laughs> so that's one or a fear of the IDF or fear of their own government. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's one of the things that I really learned um, while in the territories is that uh, there is no such thing as freedom of speech for the Palestinians, and they live in a constant fear. Right. Fear of their own government. So like, for example, when, um, when you watch Hope in the Holy Land, you, my guide is taking us, but we never show his face and we distort his voice. And there's people calling him going, what are you doing? Like, do not do this with these guys. Like don't mm. get out, right? right? But he's a truth seeker he, and he, he's very brave. And so he was willing to take us around and tell us the truth. Um, and, and he said very clearly that people do not have the, the, there's no such freedom as freedom of press. You could say one bad thing in a Facebook post and you could be killed by the Palestinian authority. You could be tortured um, to death or tortured for a long time. Um, Hamas could come get you, depending on where you are, if you're in the Gaza Strip or uh, in the West Bank proper. So fear abounds at society. Um, yeah, it, that that is... That is one of those things that really struck me mm-hmm. and gave me empathy for them because that is a, that's a heartbreaking thing because they're in bondage. Um, and I do believe in within the, Pal- or the Israeli society, there's a ton of fear, yeah. of course. I mean, for how long? I mean, um, the one th- uh, two thirds of the world's Jews were, uh, two thirds of Europe's Jews were annihilated in the Holocaust um, by the most Christianized nation in the entire world. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then just just years after that, they're almost they're you know they're almost annihilated in the Holy Land. Every you know mm-hmm. every war, mm-hmm. every every war is life and death. You know the films uh, received a lot of um, phenomenal um, accolades, and so congratulations again. Thank I think you. I think the the best one and that I resonate with was just how fair and balanced the film is. Uh, like you pulled that off. Like no one's ever done that. <laughs> um, yeah, how do you feel about you know creating? I, as a filmmaker to filmmaker, it's it's not easy going in and, and creating a documentary and trying to bring people into a narrative. But you did so so balanced. Um, yeah, I feel incredibly privileged, and I, I, it's kind of like really well, we did we did that. Yes, yeah, we did that. <laughs> but then we think you know I think about the prayer and the work that went into it and the years, um, and it, really the prayer, right? then we wanted God to <laughs> make this, <laughs> make this film through us. So mm-hmm. I think that that's, that's part of it. I, that's a huge part of it. How long did you spend in production on the film? Production was about four years, four years, seven nice. years. It was seven years from the time we thought about it until the time we, wow. That's yeah. A lot. So, yeah. That, so is that, I mean, how many trips did you guys make? To, three, three, yep. okay. three separate trips over the course of four years to try and capture the story. Yeah. And, and over those four years, my heart drastically changed. So if mm-hmm. we had all the money up front seven years, you know, right away when that seven years started, it would have been a different film. Mm-hmm. How so? What would have? Uh, my heart for the Palestinians grew um, enormously. Yeah. And it, that's a, that, that journey still continues. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's part, still part of my prayer. I don't want to give too much of the film away because I want everyone needs to see this film. Um, it's that's so what important. I keep saying. <laughs> 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 um, but the cake factory is, was just such a beacon of hope. And yes. talk to us a little bit about that scene in the movie. So we are in Ariel, which is in what people would call the, the world would call the West Bank. Jews would call that Samaria, um, Judea, Samaria. That part is in Samaria. And um, it's an Israeli owned factory that, um, that has about 70, 75, something like that percent of their workforce is Palestinians. So it's Israeli owned. Um, 
tons of Palestinians work there. Israeli Jews work there and they work there as a family. Um, mm. And it really is, it's amazing to see it, uh, to see them getting along. I mean, we didn't have to fabricate. It's not like we went and fabricated something. They're, they're happy. They're working together. They go on vacations together. They go on, uh, you know, work, you know, outings together. And the Palestinians are paid five times more there than they would in uh, a Palestinian factory. So, but that, that's in a really important scene because there's a whole movement mm -hmm. called BDS, Boycott, Divest and Sanction, mm -hmm. which is huge throughout the nation, especially in our colleges, um, where um, mainly driven by Palestinians, but there's other people involved who, who are trying to boycott those factories and because they're Israeli owned and they want them to disappear. But the thing is that doesn't help. That's like the, I asked Palestinians, what would happen if th this factory is closed down? They said, well, we, we, I'd be sitting at home. I wouldn't have any, I wouldn't have any work. Mm -hmm. So that kind of, that kind of thing, boycott, divest and sanctions doesn't help, ha doesn't ha um, help Palestinians at all. Right. And it doesn't really affect Israelis. They'll just move their factory somewhere else. Yeah. It breaks up a family. Mm. Yeah, they're like these seeds of hope. And yeah. I think that's what I, I love so much about your work is you're, you're giving light to these hopeful stories coming out of the Holy Land. And um, that's what's gonna change the future narrative. It's not gonna be some foreign policies or what kids on some campus in you know, uh, Southern California are marching about. And um, you know, what, what gives me hope is kind of like the Arab Spring, right? You had, you had all of a sudden there's this Twitter uh, you know, call to action that all the youth um, in Egypt like rise up and, and do something and it's, it's massive and it, like, it would surprise the whole world. I'm wondering if, if you think that something like that could happen in the Holy Land, like the youth of, it, of Palestine, the youth of Israel, um, you know, can rise up and actually change something where our governments have failed, our leaders have failed. Yeah. Um, well, our, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think for one, it ha has to happen with education, which was supposed to happen in, um, in the agreements a long time ago at Camp David, I think. Um, could have been the Oslo Accords now. <laughs> Fact check me, okay? <laughs> but education, Educate for Peace was one of those things. Um, and I would say that if you walk around in the Israeli society, um, moms teach their kids to um, uh, accept people and love people, love whatever, you know, whatever that looks like, but to, um, yeah, to be accepting. Um, but that is absolutely not the case in the Palestinian territories. And that is what is so heartbreaking because these little kids are indoctrinated from the birth to absolutely hate hmm. Israelis with all their soul and everything depends, the, their entire narrative is wrapped in that. And until that is, is um, changed, um, the, the peace is impossible. Uh, and I would say for the Palestinian Christians, my, my prayer for the Palestinian Christians is that they would gain God's heart for the, the Jews, mm -hmm. um, Israelis in particular. You Be feel like that's lacking? Oh yeah, the ones that I met, um, it seems like most of their energy that I is fighting Israel tooth and nail and mm -hmm. trying to get the West to hate Israel and to get on the bandwagon with hating Israel. Um, when our, as Christians, we've hated Israel long enough, it, the Jews, right? we're called in Romans 11, we're called to provoke the Jews to jealousy, to envy mm. in order that they would believe in their Messiah that we have in our heart mm -hmm. and they would want him. The church has provoked the Jews more to anger over Christendom you know, the last 2000 years than to jealousy for sure. Mm. Um, and so I would absolutely love for um, the, you know, the leaders and from, from the leaders down to the everyday Christian on the street to actually gain God's heart for the Jews. Uh, and we interviewed one, uh, one pal sweet Palestinian guy who was so brave, who told us that he gained God's heart for Israel. It changed everything yeah. for him. So I think that is one of the major things um, that needs to happen. The other thing is the Abraham Accords that is going on right now, where um, Israel kind of said, okay, well, the, the world has said, you're not gonna get peace with the Palestinian, you're not gonna get peace with the Arab world until you make peace with the Palestinians. Um, and so, it, they decided, you know what, we're going to make peace with the Arab world and hopefully peace with the Palestinians comes as well. And there's like this historic move. Um, I think there's five countries now that are 
Muslim Arab nations that have signed not only not only like a peace treaty with Israel, but like um, complete um, normalization where you have trade agreements, mm -hmm. um, tourism, all it's like a friendship, much more of a friendship. And it's just absolutely amazing what's happening there. So there's some interesting stuff going on. We saw that in Iraq when I was making the Iraq documentary, <clears throat> Kurdistan is really pro Israel, which right. makes them, it was actually kind of a source of Saddam Hussein's hatred towards them. So anyways, there's yeah, that's of, interesting, it's right? really yeah. fascinating. I yes. was like, oh, wow, okay. <laughs> yeah. Everybody everybody has a opinion on this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's, you just mentioned trade and tourism. And that was something that stood out to me in the film is you, you highlighted these two different, you had these two different scenes. One we've already mentioned, which is the factory, um, which showcases Palestinians and Israelis working alongside one another. And then this other beautiful scene centers around the surf program and some of the, um, you know, that the guest house that was, that was founded there and some of the programs that run out of there. And so you see that uh, the fruit of having a shared, like a shared endeavor or focus, whether that be fun or commerce has resulted in a lot of these really beautiful relationships that ultimately um, sap the, like the negative energy from the discourse and begin to uh, create like a new imagination for what is, is possible in relationships between the two. So I'm, I loved and appreciated that. And I, I think that is one of the great, yeah, bright spots about the Abraham Accords. Um, how can commerce and, and tourism be used as actual tools of diplomacy and relationship building? So I'm kind of curious, are you aware of any other, like what are, are there any other bright spots that you see Todd where like, hey, you know, we as nations, we're interested in finding stories of hope in broken places, you know? And so are there any other like reformers or something that you, that didn't make it in the film or that you found out about since the release of this film or different bright yeah. spots that we can highlight? That's, that's really good. We, you know, we try to highlight it is in a small way with that little um, surf class that, that we did mm -hmm. with um, a uh, Arab Israeli. He's not Palestinian. He's Arab that lives in Israel proper. Mm -hmm. So he has Israeli citizenship, uh, citizenship but he's Arab. And then another um, a Jewish Israeli guy and who are both believers in Jesus. So it's the body of Messiah. Mm. And within the body of Messiah that there is movements of, um, yeah, one new man, mm. right? There's, uh, for, for example, the Israel College of the Bible, which is in Netanya. They, um, it, it's a seminary as well as some other stuff, but I don't know, a big portion of their students are Arabs. And so you have Arabs and Israeli, Israeli Jews worshiping That's Jesus. It, it is amazing. Oh, it, cool. And, it's, it, and we really wanted to show that as the pinnacle, it, whether, that, whether that people understand that when they watch the movie, that, that that's the pinnacle of what we desire. Because mm -hmm. um, you know, business uh, ventures, that's great. The cooperating, that is great. But you know, two believers in Jesus that are supposed to hate each other come together that, and they love each other. Um, mm -hmm. That's something really special. And that is happening. Mm -hmm. That is happening. I would say we need to pray for more of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We need to pray for more of that. And it, you know, it takes, it takes bravery, probably more on the Palestinian side or the Arab side, because um, no, being seen as a normalizer, being friends with Israel or saying anything good about Israel could be uh, life-threatening for an mm -hmm. Arab. It's really something you don't do. Mm. It's easier for Arabs that live in Israel proper and they're Israeli citizens and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Way harder on the other side of um, that, that fence over there in the West Bank or Judea, Samaria. Right. Yeah, way harder. Mm -hmm. So what we try to do in the film is to highlight the Bonhoeffers, those people who are willing to go against everybody else. Uh, you, you look at Bonhoeffer, he lived in the most, uh, like we said, the most Protestant nation in, in Europe, may, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and most of the German church had gone with the Nazis. Mm -hmm. And it took very, there was very few that said, no, we're not going that way. And he started an underground church mm -hmm. um, teaching the truth, but he, he lost his life doing it. Mm -hmm. Corey Ten Boom, people like that. Mm -hmm. And that we wanted to tell those stories mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. here's the thing, what you see in the media, is the narrative. It's really easy for a Palestinian to rant against Israel and to get on the bandwagon. Um, that's, what, that's what the party line is. There, there's, that, that gets them accolades, right? It really does get them accolades. 
but to say, no, that's, that's actually not what's happening here. Like there's something else and I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to be a peacemaker. I'm going to be, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be afraid to have friends with Israelis and get to know the other side and humanize, humanize them. And that happens on both sides. But it is, like I said, it's, it's, it's a much greater risk for Palestinians mm. to do that because of this. They live in an Islamic society and that's part of what's going on. Um, the Islamic society is incredibly anti-Semitic um, and because of Islamic theology, uh, anytime a Muslim has conquered a land, it's, it's, it belongs to Islam forever. So because the Jews are on that land, it's like a smear to Allah. And so they have to do everything they can to get the Jews out. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so much stuff in play. It's not like, oh, this person hurt this, this person and that's what's going on. There's way, there's theology, there's principalities, there's, you know, there's stuff going on. There's stuff going on in the physical and there's stuff going on in the spiritual. And you're <clears throat> bringing invitation to peace. I, I like this definition. I think Sammy says this, but it's painful compromise from both parties. That's a great definition of yeah. peace. And I think yeah. that's um, where you choose to live. And that's why I think you're a reformer, man. Thank you for um, working so hard to help the church and all of humanity be better understand. Um, this yeah, thanks for conflict. what you guys are doing and the, the work that you're doing and, and making uh, films and all that stuff and the people that you're highlighting, it's amazing. So thank you. You're welcome. Hey, we want to say thank you. We got a little little prize pack for you. A little little thank you gift here. Drum roll, please. <laughs> got some uh, Nation's Coffee. Yes. We've got uh, some st sticker for your yes. surfboard. Nice. Todd's an amazing surfer. Your first movie is called Promised Land, this, produced yes. by Walking on Water. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, Promised Land, Israel through the eyes of surfers. So good. So Which good. is free on YouTube now. So Really? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Well, um, yeah, we want to invite you to watch uh, Hope in the Holy Land and see this movie, engage with it, have discussions um, around it, um, because really we can change the narrative. We can be uh, men and women of peace. And um, I think the church has an awesome, um, not only just opportunity, but um, I, I think it's a, it's a calling to bring um, peace to uh, the Holy Land. And so, yeah. Joseph, what were your takeaways from our conversation with Todd? Um, well, I started with gratitude and, and you know, end with hope. Uh, not that that's, uh, I mean, it could be kind of cliche. It is in fact in the name of it, but genuinely, yeah, hopeful for the the sort of dialogue and discourse that can be the result, uh, the fruit of a film like this. Um, hope that, yeah, if we can elevate, like you said, elevate stories, um, like some of the ones that you guys capture in the film, then we can help begin to inspire um, a new way of engaging with the complexities of the place, you know, like we see in Israel and Palestine. And, um, but also more, more than that, just that, uh, there's this personal invitation to, to reconsider, Hey, um, what are the, perhaps some of the stories that we've bought into that we've been shaped by that are distorting our ability to put ourselves in the shoes of, of the Palestinians or in the shoes of the Israelis that Todd, I just, I so much appreciate how, you know, you've been quick to mention that the biggest fruit of this film project for you was the transformation of your own heart and how you can, you can name and own the fact that, Hey, going into this, this project, I, I, I was rather hard hearted perhaps towards the Palestinians and that's something that's totally changed. And so I think, you know, when I, when I ask, well, what is hope in this situation is that, that more people would have stories like that, you know, um, that they would watch the film, that they would continue to engage with, um, with stories that don't reinforce the, the dominant narrative that we hear, which is one that's marked by fear, that's marked by division and polarization, but they would look for those cracks of, of hope because they're there to be found. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's good. It's good. Mm -hmm. Hey, um, why don't you give us a little update on what's happening in editorial? I'm going to actually steal this from Todd for just a second. Oh uh, yeah. Well, besides the fact that volume seven is in fact now out and yes, if, you, it's if you didn't get one because you missed that opportunity to be a subscriber for us, you can go and you can order it in our online store and we'll make sure Tim in the warehouse will send you one uh, with a little love note from us. So it's exciting that you can grab that. We're also already hard at work at volume eight where we've been scrounging up stories and great writers to fill the pages of volume eight. Uh, 
resonate. And of course, our goal is to be putting out at least a story a week in editorial of, of people and places that will provoke your hearts and your minds to engage with the world uh, from a posture of, of hope and seeking to be a part of the change. And so we've got this amazing story actually that we're releasing uh, next week. And it is featuring this incredible gal named Ariane. She's a French woman who has been working in Afghanistan actually for uh, the better part of 15 years. And man, I th- there'll probably be a couple of stories that come out of our relationship with her because it's just some truly spectacular stuff that's happening in in a place that is uh, really hard right now. I mean, obviously the U.S. pulling out of Afghanistan uh, in the recent past caused a whole host of issues and uh, one that the, the mainstream media has moved on from in lots of different ways. So we're thrilled about the opportunity to come in to tell some stories about what's happening, um, some hopeful things that are happening and some hard things that are happening on the ground there. So lots to look forward to in the world of editorial. Very cool. So exciting. This is Dr. Fisher, who um, his story mm-hmm. is amazing. And it's the first time we've put the, on the cover, the subject who's in a story in the magazine. So yes, a new normal. Lovely. Yeah. lovely. What about Joel? What about in film? Oh man, we got some good stuff. We've got episode two just came out in our dispatch series for Matt Spreadbury. Matt is a uh, missionary surgeon who goes to some of the most difficult places around the globe. And um, it's amazing to me that someone with the skills of a surgeon would choose to give up so much time and really risk his life to go be the hands and feet of Jesus surgically around the globe. So we're following Matt right now in uh, Rwanda. And so episode two just came out. That's exciting. Um, Episode one of the Papua New Guinea story about Samaritan aviation, a group of uh, missionary bush pilots who are working in the Sepik river. Um, This is I mean, it, you got to go there. And I got back. to go. I'm going back. Yeah. So production is happening. And then we also have uh, James Barkman, who's in Burma right now with Free Burma Rangers, Dave Eubank, who you might know from the movie Free Burma Rangers or Iraq of Forgotten Hope. So we just, we've got three amazing documentaries being filmed. And as you may know that we're releasing 10 minute episodes monthly of all three of those narratives. So yeah, subscribe and follow along. Exciting times here at Nations. Yeah, so uh, man, Todd, again, thank you so much for being on our very first podcast. I'm sure we're gonna look back on this and be like, man, we are such rookies. So (laughs) thanks for like helping us iron out the kinks. And uh, (laughs) thank you again so much for um, your friendship and just your willingness to go and uh, make beautiful movies. And thanks for letting us host it on uh, the nation's media platform. We want everybody to see it. We believe every Christian needs to see this film, so. We believe that too. So without further ado, we hope you guys have an amazing week over and out from Nations Media.